and Steel podcast. I am your host, Carl Za. And today we have another very special episode for you guys. We have returning guest, Dana Burton, who has been a pioneer in the Chinese hip hop scene, uh, bringing hip hop straight from the streets of Detroit. Uh, today, we uh, so Dana was previously on my show to talk about his own experience uh, living as a black American, uh, living in China for over a decade now, right? Dana, or oh, two, two, 20 years? 22 years. 22 years. Wow, that's almost like a lifetime. I mean, you witnessed the transformation of China in the last 22 years, and there's a lot of changes. Uh, so, so you you saw how China changed in real time, and uh, today what uh, Dana wanted to talk to us about is a very special topic, uh, because we're coming up to the anniversary of assassination of Malcolm X, and uh, and a lot of people, of course, a lot of people know about Malcolm X, uh, you know, being a great uh, leader. Uh, you know, civil rights leader in U.S., but a lot of people even may even read Malcolm X, but not many people know about his connection, the connection between Malcolm X and China. And that's what we are here to talk about, what Dana is going to help us to understand. So so welcome again, Dana, and uh, let's get straight to this topic because this is fascinating. Th- thanks for having me, Carl. It's always a pleasure to be here on your podcast. And yeah, I'm really excited. This is something that's deeply personal to me. I'm a Detroiter. Um, this is a place where Malcolm X spent a lot of his formative years, his life, his family based in Detroit. And he has had a profound effect on me, as well as millions of people all over the world. And it is a little known fact about Malcolm. Um, there's so much attention given to Malcolm X, so much research and studies. And there's always passing mention and, and plenty of evidence for its connection of China, but I've never seen like an in-depth study into it. And I think that's, that's, that's fascinating because he spoke about China a lot. Uh, he, he actually never stopped talking about China. It just keeps coming up over and over again in some really uh, interesting ways. And Malcolm X was a huge inspiration on me. And, you know, believe it or not, he was, you know, at the, the core of why I came to China in the first place. I was a wow. Malcolmite and I was inspired by Malcolm X and the things that he said. And so generally when people talk about Malcolm X, uh, they, they compartmentalize his life. They section it off into three main periods. This kind of pre-nation of Islam period, the Malcolm Red period, where he's a wayward youth and involved in crime and drugs and all kind of wildness on the East Coast and Boston and, and Harlem. Then the next period is his transformation and and joining the Nation of Islam. And finally, the third period, when he breaks from the Nation of Islam, um, fully embraces Orthodox Islam and becomes more of an internationalist uh, hero. And uh, what's, what's, what's cool to me is that when he talks about his life in the autobiography, um, his, his pre Nation of Islam days, he actually makes a lot of passing reference to China. And I can tell, that Chinese culture had an influence on him. He keeps talking about Chinese food. Like he's making these little subtle comments about Chinese rice and Chinese food. And and he's comparing Chinese rice to the rice made by one of the owners of a restaurant that he's working in. And so it's clear to me that he was a bit of a foodie and he's been, you know, eating Chinese food and enjoying food. He makes passing reference to like Chinese firecrackers. And this is just the beginning, you know, this is all in the autobiography of the Malcolm X, right? Is, is it all written down in the book? Yeah, it's actually in the book. He makes these little subtle references where he, you know, hints at China during those early stages. And, um, you know, he makes the connection a lot more explicit when he gets into prison, when he talks about, you know, he starts studying history and going to these libraries and, and just becoming a, a readaholic and reading everything he could and, and being obsessed with history and comparative history. And China is one of you know the, his biggest influences. And it's something he keeps coming back to time and time again in all of his speeches. He keeps making references to you know, China as this anti-colonial power. 
and as an example of uh, inspiration and influence for the black community. And it's something that um, kind of really congeals and comes together when uh, he breaks from the Nation of Islam and then he, he has these trips abroad. I think he spent like over six months abroad uh, towards the last year of his life. Uh, he, he had two major trips where he went to Africa and the Middle East. And he actually begins to link up with Chinese diplomats and he starts to heavily get involved you, you, what should they, he starts to endorse and actually rub elbows with uh, a lot of African socialists and revolutionary groups that are actually getting support and funding from, from the Chinese government. And so this all comes out in his speeches. And I'm looking at all of the last speeches of his life. It seems as if every single speech that he made in, in you know, the, the last months of his life, he made some kind of reference to China. So it wasn't just some passing thing. It was a it was a really important uh, piece of his analysis. And so, you know, he said things like, you know, he talked about his admiration for Mao versus Nehru, and he juxtaposed, you know, the, the tra trajectory that China was on compared to India, and he said he was completely for Mao in that approach. He celebrated China's entry into the atomic, you know, weapons and nuclear weapons uh, club and become an independent nation. And he talked about the importance of having different centers of power outside of the Western world. And, um, you know, again, just forging ties with these, these revolutionary leaders. And, and I think what's, what's also interesting to me that I'm researching and just digging up information on is the possible connection to his assassination. That we, you know, we have enough evidence for at least investigating more into why he was assassinated. And some people have made some links to, you know, the cause of his death could have been linked to CIA involvement um, in Vietnam, in Laos, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, communists, the Communist Party, and his push, uh, you know, his push against drugs. Basically, it's an argument that the CIA wanted to protect its drug cartel and its drug smuggling um, uh, in Laos, in Vietnam, and didn't want anyone stopping that. And, and Malcolm was pushing back against the drug dealers in Harlem that were being funded by this cartel, as well as aligning, potentially aligning himself with, you know, uh, Chinese communists. That's, and, uh, a great, that's a story a very little people know about. I mean, first of all, little, very little people even know about the Malcolm X connection with China, despite, you know, Malcolm X being this been this uh, iconic figure and a lot of people have read him yet somehow this Malcolm X and the China connection just escape a lot of people's radar and, and uh, reading a lot of these passages which you quoted I find it very inspiring that he felt inspired by China's example like he he it almost feel like he was empowered by this example of a non-white nation rising up against western imperialism uh, and 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 he thought that's that's an example that uh, the, the the black community in U.S. should emulate, and and he he explicitly made mention of how he felt admiration for Mao's militancy approach, and this is this is like. This is just all fascinating that I am only finding out about this very now. And, you know, like my own personal introduction to Malcolm X was in 19, through the 1990, uh, was a 1992 movie, Malcolm X by Spike Lee. I was in high school and I, 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 I watched that movie. It was very inspirational, but for a long time, that was all of my knowledge about Malcolm X was through the consumption of that movie. And, 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 but to actually read his own written and spoken words, it's just so powerful and so in inspirational. Uh, so, sorry for interrupting. Go, go ahead. No, not at all. I mean, um, I, you know, we're going through the same journey. We're, we're close in age, and uh, that's exactly what happened to me, being familiar with Malcolm X. Um, you know, in my community, we had a lot of institutions named after him and organizations. But as a young high school kid, um, it was that movie that really, it was the movie and also hip hop culture that started to really promote Malcolm X and get me interested and in reading the book, the autobiography of Malcolm X, watching that film. There was a lot of commercialization about Malcolm X with the hats and the t-shirts. 
And so that really began my journey into to Malcolm X st studies. And so I, I'm right there with you. So one of the things, you know, I, I'll read some quotes. Uh, when he was in prison, he talks about, you know, coming into contact with these historians like, you know, Will Durant and the story of Oriental civilization. And, um, you know, he, he spends a large amount of time in the autobiography of Malcolm X, you know, talking about his prison time, giving the example of China's uh, reaction to the opium wars and how China stood up. And, and he goes into a lot of detail into that, giving that example. He talks about the Treaty of Nan, you know, Nanking and how the Chinese were made uh, to pay the British for, quote, the white man for the destroyed opium forced open China's major ports to British trade, forced China to abandon Hong Kong, fixed China's import tariffs so low that cheap British articles soon flooded in, maiming China's industrial development. I mean, he goes on, he gives a really detailed analysis into uh, the impact that colonialism had on China. He's talking about, quote, after a second opium war, the Shenzhen treaties legalized the ravaging opium trade legalized a British, French, American control of customs in China, in China delaying the treaty ratification. He said, quote, he's, he's quoting the, the British, I mean, qu quoting the Chinese standing up against uh, the British, kill the foreign white devils, was the 1901 Chinese war cry in the Boxer Rebellion. So he, he goes into it in detail and even links it later to, to the struggle in the United Nations. So, and, and this comes up on and on in, in many of his speeches. And, and for me, I find that link uh, in terms of my connection with the Chinese people as an African-American that grew up in a community that was ravaged by drugs and experiencing this firsthand and seeing the drug trade and knowing that this was somehow all by design. Like, like for us, it wasn't a simple matter of just criminality and a corrupt local community, we knew that it was impossible for these drugs to get into our community without some kind of military and government support and without the police turning a blind eye. So it was as if our community was under attack and someone intentionally was trying to weaken us with drugs. And here is China, uh, a society facing the exact same issue of which the Americans were heavily involved since, you know, since day one of using drugs as a weapon to weaken their country, weaken their power, and destabilize their society. And this is a, a common touch point that, that Malcolm talks about. Another interesting thing that, that about Malcolm is, on many occasions, he referred to Asians in general, but Chinese specifically, as black. He actually said that red communists are not uh, a common, co communist, they're black. They're black people. And, and he, he did this as a sign of solidarity uh, with their struggle. And time and time again, he talks about the black revolution, the global black revolution, which includes all people of color, including Chinese people. So we've got a lot of information to, to kind of digest and get into a lot of quotes from him. Um, but maybe you want to chime in a little bit about the, you know, the opium wars to give people some context. I, I just find it amazing that Malcolm X got radicalized in prison by, by you know, reading religiously at the prison library. And he did all these historical research while he was in prison. And, and he, with, with, with a very sharp analytical mind, you know, he was able to see through all the bullshit and, and to understand history as it happened. And what I wanted to talk about is uh, the, the CIA and drug connection that you mentioned briefly. That's also ties to the ravaging of the black community in U.S. You are right, it's intentional. And for a long time, when that was pointed out, it was labeled as some kind of conspiracy theory. <laughs> Until, um, like, Alfred McCoy, a very great uh, jour independent journalist, he wrote a book called The Politics of Heroin. Uh, uh, and and it, 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 it detailed the U.S. CIA involvement in promoting the drug trade in Southeast Asia. And that gets tied into the war that was waged in Vietnam and how CIA was using the drug money to finance its secret operations in, 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 in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, all throughout Southeast Asia. 
and they they turn not only they turn a blind eye to all the drug shipment coming to the U.S., but they also uh, try to cover it up by saying uh, at, at the time that it was the U.S. Uh, Bureau Federal Bureau of uh, of Narcotics, the head of the FBN, he said Mao was flooding. American market with opium and heroin. In actual fact, the Red China at the time under Mao was banning opium cultivation, completely eradicating the opium addiction inside the country, completely eradicating uh, opium uh, 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 growing and cultivation. And that actually created such a supply shock that CIA leveraged as an opportunity to start their own opium production in the northern Myanmar, in the Golden Triangle area of northern Myanmar, Laos, and and and, and northern Thailand, and that that was uh, with with the help with um, with the CIA financed uh, KMT Remnant Army in Myanmar, and that grew up grew into a huge business. Uh, by the time Vietnam War rolls around, when uh, a lot of the American GIs who you know got conscripted to fight a war that they they probably had no idea what's it about, got addicted to a heroin that was producing the Golden Triangle under the guise of the CIA, and then then the American GIs and br- bring their uh, heroin habits back to the United States, and and as you say, this is all condoned and supported by the CIA and their proxies. And they, 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 this is, this is, this is not a conspiracy theory, folks. This is well documented. Um, I highly recommend Alfred McCoy's book, uh, "The Heroin, uh, the, the the Politics of Heroin," and also um, just to to um, plug in my own show on Silk and Steel podcast. I'm actually doing a series on the Opium Tray and the Golden Triangle series. Uh, I it's it's running like. Five, so I think it's eight episodes now. We started from the beginning, from the even before the Opium War, when the when the Europeans started the Opium trade, to uh to the to the CIA operation in the Golden Triangle in the 1950s. So okay, so uh, that's enough of my self promotion. Let's get back to Malcolm X and and his China connections. No, I mean I, I appreciate that because um I'm definitely going to jump into your podcast. This this is. Uh, connecting the dots to the research that I'm doing as well, um, we, we've got some really eye-opening evidence to what happened to Malcolm while he was in China and, you know, actual CIA documents uh, that are linking some kind of conspiracy and narrative to which, you know, uh, surprisingly, you know, informants for the CIA are leaking stories to the American press suggesting that Malcolm X was somehow involved in, in this drug smuggling ring that was run by the Chinese and the Cubans, and that he was killed because of that. It's, you know, so like a lot of the American talking, talking points about China back then and now, it's all projection. The CIA are themselves doing the drug running, and they're blaming on the Chinese communists. And, and, the, and, the, 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 and also, uh, Malcolm X was actually... Uh, put under safe surveillance by FBI, right? Way back in the 1950s, when uh, they when they suspect him of communist sympathies because they keep on talking about China, <laughs> and so they had him on, on on the watch list. So yeah, like the, the he every his move every one of his movement was monitored and surveyed by the government. That, that that's absolutely right. I believe that the first record we have of Malcolm X in the FBI files, which have been released, um, was 1953, and they referenced uh, 1950, when Malcolm was uh, alleged to have written a letter to President Truman, where Malcolm says that, I have always been a communist, and um, that's when they started uh, uh, documenting him. So it goes all the way back to 1953, and in, in my research, I found Malcolm X coming up in the CIA and FBI files under the heading of Chinese communism. So there's actually <laughs> sections on Chinese communism and they're looking at, at Malcolm X. But I want to jump into like these connections. You know, he, he, you know, Malcolm went to Africa in 1964 and one of the places that, the first places he went to was Ghana. And at that particular time, Ghana had pretty much became the base 
for China's outreach into Africa. Ghana was the main base where they had the most resources and diplomats and were reaching out to different uh, revolutionary groups based in Ghana. And so when he goes to Ghana, he connects with a group of African-Americans who were also heavily tied to China and, had, and many of them had you know, ended up traveling to China. One of them was Vicki Garvin. She was a host who welcomed Malcolm X and took, took him around. At that time, she was teaching English in Ghana to the Cuban embassy, to the Algerian embassy and the Chinese embassy. And she later was invited to China and taught English. It, not only taught English, she, she taught black history and culture in Shanghai and Beijing for a number of years. As well, uh, Shirley Graham Du Bois at that time was based in Ghana. And she had through her, you know, herself and her husband and her children, by the way, uh, were, spent a lot of time in China. Her, her, her children studied and were fluent in Chinese. And uh, I believe she actually passed away in China. And so there she is in Ghana uh, with direct connections to Mao, to Zhou Enlai, and uh, communicating with Malcolm X and providing assistance. And assistance. And there was another brother who wasn't in Ghana at the time, but is heavily related, and that's brother Robert F. Williams, who uh, was in Cuba and, and at, at that time, I believe, had already uh, at least made his first visit to China, I believe, and went back a, a few other times. Um, Robert Williams w went with his wife, Mabel Williams, and actually his children. And I've learned recently that when Robert was, you know, went to visit China for the first time and and influenced you know, Mao Zedong to write his first uh, public statement in solidarity with the African-American community. Robert and his wife went back to Cuba and they left their children in China. And his children stayed in China and got educated there. Yeah, that's wow. pretty powerful uh, to, to have that trust and, and relationship uh, where you can leave your kids to get educated in a country like that. So um, yeah, I, I know Robert went to China. I didn't know he left his children to be educated in China. Wow. Yeah, they, they spent time there and um, learned Chinese. And so when Malcolm was, and, and he talks about this in his autobiography, uh, I guess the version I have is page three, uh, 377. He talks about meeting the Chinese ambassador. And I'm, I'm going to read the quote, the passage. Chinese ambassador, Mr. Huang Hua, gave a state dinner in my honor. The, the guests included Cuban and Algerian ambassadors, and it was also here that I met Mrs. W.E.B. Du Bois. And after the excellent dinner, three films were shown. And I've learned later that those films were, um, one of them was about the African-American struggle. One of them was about the Algerian revolution. And, and I need to check my notes to what the, the third film was about. But they, he, he saw three films that I'm actually interested to track down and, and see what was in those films. And, um, oh, here's the third one. He says himself. Uh, you know, prominently shown in the film was the militant former North Carolina African-American Robert Williams, who has since taken refugee in Cuba after his advocacy that the American black people should take up arms to defend and protect, protect themselves. The second film focused on the Chinese people's support for the African-American struggle. And Chairman Mao Zedong was delivering his statement of that support, and the film offered sickening moments of graphic white brutality police and civilian to African-Americans who were demonstrating in various U.S. cities seeking civil rights. And the final film was a dramatic presentation of the Algerian Revolution. So he had a film on Robert Williams, a film on the African-American struggle, and one on the Algerian Revolution. And the Malcolm X Committee, which was the, the group of African-Americans based in Ghana looking after him, rushed him from the Chinese embassy dinner to where he went uh, later to uh, to the press club and, to, you know, to see Gana the Ghanaian lifestyle and later on to connect with Kwame Nkrumah. And some of the interesting things that I, I find is that when I look at the speeches that Malcolm gave when he went back to the United States, you know, these, like, he makes these really provocative statements and these really vivid descriptions of China. And, and in passing, it just may seem like you know, just, just provocative language. But all of them are linked to policy objectives and political objectives. And it's clear that he had a real strong understanding of China's goals. Like he was pushing for 
China to be recognized at the United Nations. He wanted them to have their seat. He was pushing back of the United States completely ignoring, as he would say, the 700 million Chinese as if they didn't exist. Uh, he was pushing back against Taiwan being propped up as this puppet government, as the official government of China. Um, you know, so he was doing these things in his speeches. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, you know, after he was assassinated, it was Kwame Nkrumah, who was one of the first African leaders in Ghana, who came to the United Nations to actually speak on the world stage about these very issues. And so we see those connections. But what, what is it, like a, a little piece of evidence that I want to put out there that, that I think needs much more research and much more attention is this man by the name of Victor Reisel. And Victor Reisel, um, I believe he got famous. Uh, I'm not sure of the story. You know, something about he was he was engaged in some kind of a labor union situation, and the mob threw acid on him. And he was a reporter or a journalist or activist. The mob hit him with a with an acid attack, and he got widely famous in America because of this. In in the 1940s and 50s, he became a bit of a you know, uh, some kind of a hero and an established credible figure, but he was staunchly anti-communist and he was following Malcolm and doing a lot of writing on him. And he alleges that he actually followed Malcolm X to China and he was there trailing Malcolm X and saying that Malcolm X was running around with Chinese communists and, and, and linking up with the Chinese communists. And he kind of degraded and kind of downplayed Malcolm's time in Egypt, uh, where Malcolm was trying to link up with the African American, I'm mean, sorry, the African Organization of Unity, the AOU, and the Organization of African Unity. Uh, he was trying to connect with them in Egypt. They were having a conference. And Reisel says Malcolm absolutely did not get into the conference. He was on the outside. It was just a propaganda campaign. And even and, and I'm getting this source from the FBI files. He's quoted in the FBI files. He's providing this information to the FBI and CIA. He's saying that Malcolm met with African leaders that were friends of mine, people that I helped to cultivate. And they all said no way that they would see this, you know, take some time to meet with this radical kind of leader. And so he completely dismisses Malcolm. And what's interesting is you know, while Malcolm was in Egypt, this was the time that Malcolm was poisoned. So Malcolm almost got, you know, he, 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 he says in his autobiography that he believes that he was possibly poisoned by this food and he got really sick. And the same time that this man is trailing him, connected to the CIA. And what makes things more interesting is that Victor Reisel would go on and release an article uh, after Malcolm X was killed. And in that article, he alleges, uh, you know, that somehow Malcolm was connected to this drug ring. And there's also another journalist that, that, that leaks this story. And they're quite inflammatory stories. They speak about it as, as if it's almost fact that the Cubans and the Chinese are selling heroin in Harlem. And that's why Malcolm X got killed. And what we do know is... Um, when Malcolm X, you know, after his assassination, uh, the Chinese government did come out, the Cuban government, I believe, as well, and several other African governments came out and said, uh, alleged that he was killed by, this, by U.S. imperialists, and in some, some articles uh, implicated the CIA, as well as Malcolm's own sister, uh, half-sister, Ella, reported to the media after his death immediately that she believed that he was killed by the CIA. So we've got something to look into. And I think that um, as I'm geared up for Black History Month, as there's all this attention that you put out, you know, and that I'm seeing that I'm living through where there's a concerted disinformation attempt to kind of divide the Black community from China. Uh, I think it's a, a great time to look back over this history and, and share the facts that we've discovered uh, so that we can kind of connect the dots to what's happening right now. Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that's great because, like, um, it, it, people don't even realize, you know, China has this long connection with Africa. You know, Malcolm made a mention of this when he was uh, basically ridiculous, uh, ridicul 
ridiculating the the idea that you know this uh, Jiang Kai Shi's puppet government on Taiwan could represent all of China. He said, uh, in fact, he said he, like when he went to Af, you know, um, let, let me try to find the the exact quote here. He said, China is a nation of seven hundred million people. Physically, they exist. Physically, they exist. I don't go along with American reaction of pretending that seven hundred million Chinese don't exist. When I was in Africa during the summer, everywhere I looked, I saw Chinese, and that's in nineteen. Uh, that's what Malcolm X wrote in nineteen sixty-five. You know, this is a time when Maoist China was supporting uh, anti-colonial struggles in Africa, like all over the continent. And 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 Mao has sent many you know, Chinese engineers to Africa to help build the infrastructure. Most famously, the the the, the Tanzania uh, railway. Um, and and the um, and, and you know this this chi China Africa connection goes way back. But now now today in the in the kind of the new Cold War that's being waged uh, by the United States against China. You know, you see in especially Anglo mainstream media, you see uh, all the mention about so-called Chinese neo-colonialism in Africa. Chinese is a new carrying out new imperialism in, in China. I mean, I, I, these people is so blatantly dishonest. You know, to compare what China is doing today to you know to say like the Belgian Congo when when. Uh, the the the, the Belgian colonialists were literally cutting off the hands and legs of Africans who resisted of being enslaved to to you know basically exploiting Congo's resources. I mean, this this the the, the, the today's propaganda is 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 so ridiculous. At uh, you know, it's based on people's ignorance. It's based on people's ignorance of China. Uh, their ignorance of China's role in the world, ign ignorance with China, China, China's interaction with other countries outside of the Western world. Because uh, let's face it, you know, as people who well, both of us have have a lot of experience growing up in in U.S., people in U.S. have a very little context. You know, they, they what what instead they get fed daily through these. Propagandas, basically, in in our media about China, about this really scary place that that's somehow threatening our you know Western civilization, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you know this propaganda. What's interesting about it is, and, and especially you know, when we're looking at this example where they're trying to put the the assassination of Malcolm X on China and the Cubans. And what you, you know, said is absolutely right. Like they're basically leaving breadcrumbs to the truth because it's pure projection. And it's as if they're telling the truth, right? They're telling us, but the truth is the exact opposite of what they're saying. And if we just look at face value, what they're saying and kind of dig beneath the, you know, the surface, we'll get closer and closer to the truth. They're basically implicating themselves and, and kind of just like, you know, shifting the blame for exactly what they're doing towards someone else. And it's it's a really deceptive thing. I'm looking at some of the, like, like the quotes that Malcolm X has given us. And from an African-American perspective, uh, there, there's one particular quote that every Black person knows that's, that's, a, that, that's a Malcolm X, and a, a Malcolmite. And that's, of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. That quote is everywhere. They make posters of this quote. You can see this, this, this poster in the African American Museum in Detroit. You can go to you know, black schools in, in, all across America. They may have a picture of Malcolm X with this quote. Of all our study, history is best qualified to reward our research. And what I find interesting about that quote is, it was taken from a speech a message to the grassroots on November 10th, 1963. And everyone mentions that quote, but they fail to mention what Malcolm said immediately preceding that quote. And immediately preceding that quote, he was talking about China. And what he said was, quote, the Chinese revolution, they wanted land. They threw the British out. 
along with the Uncle Tom Chinese. Yeah, they did. They set a good example. And he goes on, and he goes on at length, giving examples of what was happening in China. And he's using that to inspire Black people in America. He talks about how there are no Toms in China. And today it's one of the toughest, roughest, most feared countries on earth by the white man because there are no Uncle Toms over there. And then he says, of all our studies, history is best we qualify to reward our research. And when you see that you've got problems, all you have to do is examine the historical method used all over the world by others who have problems similar to yours. And once you see how they got theirs straight, then you will know how you can get yours straight. And so he was encouraging his people to study Chinese history, to study Latin American history, to study the history of the world and the struggle of other people and learn from them in, in, in solidarity, to not isolate yourself and to have a narrow view and only see the world through a lens of your own experience. This is a limitation intentionally put upon the community that he was trying to break people out of. And he goes on and on in Spellman, March 19th, 1964. You know, he's, he's talking uh, about the civil rights movement and comparing it to the human rights movement. He says that uh, once the civil rights movement expanded to a human rights movement, our African brothers and our Asian and Latin American brothers can place it on the agenda at the General Assembly that is coming up this year. And Uncle Sam has no more say in it then. And we have our friends outside the UN, 700 million Chinese who are ready to die for human rights. This is Malcolm X in 1964. In April 3rd, 1964, the ballot of the bullet, he says, don't let anyone tell you anything about the odds are against you. If they draft you and they send you to Korea and make you face 800 million Chinese, if you can brave over there, you can be brave right here. These odds aren't as great as those odds. And if you fight here, you will at least know what you're fighting for. So he's trying to wake people up from being sent overseas uh, to, to fight against the Chinese instead of standing and fighting at home uh, for their own rights. And we see that happening today where my mind is baffled by the fact that my ancestors were brought across the Atlantic Ocean on ships as slaves to work for Western imperialism. And now in, in modern times, they want to send our brothers and sisters back across the Pacific to fight for Western imperialism. Uh, we saw what happened on that first boat ride over to America. I say, don't take the bait. Don't get on those ships. Now is your Kilgore moment. Don't let them send our babies overseas to die at the bottom of the South China Sea. No, I say no to the war. I, I oppose it before people are even aware that it's happening. But the fact that just the other day, a plane crashes uh, in, in the South China Sea, where no bullets and no weapons have been fired at them, and this isn't the first calamity that's happened. Boats keep crashing into islands, planes keep dropping bombs accidentally in China, crashing into other Chinese planes, falling to. We need to get the hell out of there. It's none of our damn business. And let China settle its own civil war, let it conclude its own civil war, let it handle its own internal affairs. And we definitely don't need to be losing our lives over there. So excuse me for my rant, but that's how it connects to how I feel today. But when I look back over the things that Malcolm X was saying. No, that's great. I mean, that's why I bring you on the show, because we're on the same wavelength here. I mean, I'm, I, 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 one of the reasons I started my podcast is because I'm sick and tired of U.S. foreign policy, this, this constant shilling for endless wars all over the globe. You know, the, our, my, the U.S. government did not have my consent. Right. But yet fighting my name. I mean, that that should that need to stop. So, so thank you for for speaking up. Yes, sir, indeed. Um, I got to see a, a few more quotes. Um, June 2nd, 1964. He's 
being interviewed by Robert Penn, and he's making the distinction between Malcolm and Nehru. And Malcolm says, I think that Nehru probably was a good man, although I didn't go for it. I don't go for anybody who is passive. I don't go for anybody who is who is who advocates pacism or peaceful uh, surrendering of any form whatsoever. I don't go for it. And then the interviewer says, what about Jesus Christ? And Malcolm says, I go for Mao Zedong much more than Nehru. I think Nehru brought his country up in a beggar's role. Uh, their role, the role of India and its reliance on the West during the years since it got suppo its supposed independence, has it today just as helpless and dependent as when it got its independence. Whereas in China, the Chinese fought for independence. They became militant right from the outset. And today, even though they are not loved, they are respected. Though the West doesn't love them, the West respects them. Now the West doesn't respect India, but it loves India. So, um, and again, at his own rally, this is shortly before he's assassinated, July 5th, 1964. Um, you know, he, he's asked a question, I believe by the audience. Uh, you know, they're asking him about being so vocal about standing up and defending yourself and, and standing up for your rights. They say, well, don't you think the element of surprise would be better able to get the same thing done? And his example is China. He says, before the Chinese came across the Yalu during the Korean War, they told Uncle Sam, don't come another step or else we're going to do such and such a thing. They were so confident in their ability to take on anything Sam had. They said, don't come another step or we're going to do this and so and so. Brother, let me tell you about a Klansman. He's a coward. And so he's just, again, trying to inspire his own people through the example of China. And um, January 1924, 1965, one month before he dies, um, he talks about uh, the Chinese. And, and he talked about, you know, the, the, the Japanese, uh, 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 you know, when they got hit in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and then he tries to make the juxtapose them with the Chinese, saying that they can they can do it even better, and they've got more people to do it with, and now they've got more explosives to do it with. He said uh, he he was referring to later. He goes on to refer to the British and and their use of gunpowder, and he says you know he mistakenly says something like the British invented gunpowder. Then he corrects himself. He says I started to say invented gunpowder, but they didn't invent it. The Chinese invented it. And the Chinese use it for peaceful purposes. Marco Polo, I think it was Marco, wasn't it? He got a hold of it and brought it back to Europe. And immediately they started using it to kill people with. And, um, you know, he, he just keeps going on and on. He gets interviewed February 18th. This is like three days before he's killed. And this is where we see Malcolm, uh, I believe they're starting to set him up. That he's, he's starting to get pulled into this trap because... He went to, to Africa. He's meeting with these leaders. They're already leaking the stories and the multiple stories that somehow he's connected with these Chinese drug dealers and somehow he's getting money. That's the big thing that they're, they're suggesting, that he's getting money from the Chinese communists, and so he needs to be neutralized. And um, so one of the stories that they leak is this, this group called the, the Blood Brothers, the Harlem Blood Brothers, which is this alleged gang in Harlem that's supposedly selling drugs and into, uh, you know, anti-white violence. And they're trying to link Malcolm to that group and then link him with, with communists and, and set him up. And as soon as he comes back from Africa, he's being interviewed by the press and they keep pressing him on this question. They keep, you know, trying to get him to say things. And there's this interview with Stan Bernard, again, February 18th, 1965, he said, well, there's a caller that calls in and says, right, um, I'd like to ask you something, which you mentioned about aid from Red China. And then Malcolm jumps in. I never mentioned anything about aid from Red China. And I guess there's another uh, guest on the show. He says, ask Dr. Hall here. He's an expert. I think he'll even have to agree with that. And the caller says, uh, I asked you if the aid might, might Charlie came from red Chinese. Oh, the aid to fight Charlie came from red Chinese. Would you accept it? 
you said, from anybody. And Malcolm says, well, that doesn't specify red China. I said this, that when you're in the den of a wolf and a fox comes along and, and offers to help you, you'll accept help from any sor source available against that wolf. And then the, the host says, but they ask you. And Malcolm says, that doesn't mean I love foxes. And then the, the host pushes again. But they specify whether they ask you the question, whether they, and then Malcolm goes back. I don't think they said communist China. If I recall, I could be wrong. But I don't think they specified communist China. Although, let me say this about communist China. China is a nation of 700 million people. Physically, they exist. Uh, you don't want them to exist. We shouldn't pretend they don't. But the point is, you know, they're pushing him and pushing him to try to admit that somehow he's getting funds from, from the Chinese. And uh, this is something that comes out after he's dead, where they allege that he was. And so... You, you know, the, um, what's crazy? The, what's crazy is after all the BLM movement, like recently I see, uh, you know, some media uh, in, the, in, the, in the Western press, there's the idea that somehow China is in, instigating racial tensions in United States. I mean, that is crazy talk. I mean, like it's it's to pretend that racial tensions does racial problem does not exist in U.S. That China need to even stir it up. It's like these people got their heads so far up their ass. You know, they 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 even deny that there's racial problems in U.S. That is a result of foreign interventions. You know, so, so foreign meddling in U.S. That's that's stirring up what normally peaceful Americans into battling each other. This is preposterous. I mean, this is the same kind of rhetoric they've been doing, you know, since the Cold War, since the Malcolm X era. They're still do saying the same shit. I mean, it's the it's the exact same tactic. Um, you know, what's interesting is that you know people are suggesting that uh, I believe I don't want to get the the, the person there. I believe, I believe it was Farmer from Core. So that the U.S. government is backing up other African-American leaders uh, against Malcolm. And they actually sent this guy to Africa to kind of follow in the footsteps of Malcolm and repair relationships with these African leaders and kind of align them with the U.S. government. And they interview this, this, this leader, Farmer, who's been alleged to be an um, agent. They say, hey, what do you know about this? connection between Malcolm and these communists. And he, he says, I wouldn't doubt it. It's, it makes sense to me. And we're seeing the same thing happen today, where you see people like Candace Owens and Herschel Walker. Uh, Herschel Walker, ex-football player running for uh, governor, is coming out. And he made the allegation that Black Lives Matter was funded by the Chinese communists. Yet he had absolutely zero evidence of this. But he is willing, a man running for governor, has a black man, to, to make this allegation with no evidence, and people just buy it and don't push back on it. And then Candace Owens, who said that, you know, uh, Biden pulled out of Afghanistan because he was taking orders from the Chinese. Like, the most ridiculous arguments are being made. You can say anything you want about China. You can make up anything, and people will let it fly. And it's sad that we have African Americans buying into this, whether it's conservative or, you know, or on, and it's on the left. And one of the reasons I'm speaking out is because I'm watching this movement to silence the left and be really critical of the left in America. Now, anyone who is even remotely moderate about China and wants to encourage people to just to be objective and analyze the situation. Uh, they're being attacked and vilified and, 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 and being uh, portrayed in the media as, you know, agents of, of, of the CPC. So it's a really aggressive move. Like, there's multiple articles that have come out. And I'm seeing like, well, hey, maybe this funding that, uh, you know, Biden uh, applied for, these millions of dollars to combat China uh, has kicked in because uh, it's happening right now in real time. The Nation released an article uh, there's multiple articles, even in so-called left-wing DSA, all bashing um, anyone connected with China. And um, it's, it's the same story. It's the same 
uh, scenario. Oh yeah, the um, the Nation article is so ridiculous. They basically interview a couple of uh, disgruntled DA, DSA member, a couple of dissenters, and presented them as the face of of a progressive movement when they're just a bunch of. Uh, 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 you know, like a disgruntled DSA member who weren't happy with the way the DSA Foreign Committee is going, and and but you know, but the the goal was to attack people who don't want U.S. to be involved in another Cold War because, like, why? I thought I I grew up um, at a time when the Cold War one was ending, right? Back then, everybody almost universally agreed Cold War was a bad idea. You know, thank God it's it's it ended, and now we are getting this idea from the from the media that somehow the Cold War with China is a imperative. It's 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 China is somehow existential threat to the United States, and that we must engage in Cold War two dot oh for China. I mean, nobody is even asking the question: Is this is is this correct? I mean, like, do we need a Cold War two dot <laughs> Nobody's asking that questions. I mean, I mean, the, the people people are not even pretending the co- people people are not even pretending like Cold War is 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 uh is not is not bad anymore. I mean, I mean, like we we this has got it so ridiculous that that's why originally I started out. Uh, you know, on social media and my podcast want to talk, uh, focus on Chinese history, Chinese culture, uh, you know, to, to introduce it to the, to the English audience. But I, I can't help in today's environment, but to be political because I, I felt I haven't been radicalized just by all these kind of attacks. I, I mean, I was fe- myself was featured in a report by Aspie. Aspie, this think tank, Australian think tank, founded by Lockheed Martin, <laughs> founded by Raytheon and U.S. State Department. I was labeled as one of the, you know, the the the, the chi- China uh, influencers. You know, the the influencers that 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 that, that, that help promote China's line uh, in social media. And then, then New York Times uh, and and Aspie the collaborated to do another hit on the YouTubers who who do their uh, you know film their everyday lives in China as somehow you know as, as uh, Chinese sponsor shills. And I I was actually upset. I was absolutely upset that I wasn't on that list <laughs> because I guess I, I'm not more i'm not as prolific on my youtube channel as i'm on on my podcast so so maybe i that that means i just need to do better i just i gotta put this video out there on my channel get more views get more people interested i want to be on the list of new york times as the china sponsor shows i i don't know brother you know i, I appreciate you like your spirit your cavalier spirit but uh i mean these are literally the people that are engaging in the disinformation. We've caught them red-handed. Like you talk about asking, like they're the ones publishing the disinformation. Uh, they're the ones that are sowing the seeds of destruction. And so when they put your name on that list, like I, I think about all of the brothers and sisters that have become victims of these kinds of things. Like, uh, I don't take it for granted, man. I don't scoff at it. Even though in this open digital world where social media, where all of us uh, have much more ability to be political actors, um, I know very well from my own personal experience from loved ones that I know who have been victims of the CIA and FBI how dangerous this game is. Uh, They put targets on me. I've had run-ins. you know, I, I think, you know, back in 2007, when Foreign Policy Magazine did that article on me, and it was done by my brother, Jeff Chang, who, who quoted me, but then I got interviewed, and they labeled my interview as Black Muslim convert is the godfather of Chinese hip hop. I looked at that as them putting a target on my back because I didn't speak anything about my race or my religion. I was talking about hip hop, yet they found that uh, in a very provocative magazine like Foreign Policy, that they're going to use this headline. And you look at their politics, like uh, it's dangerous because you don't know who's looking at this information and what repercussions come with it. And so, um, yeah, man, like like these people running their mouths, like, you know, you just don't label someone or target someone 
in the media, and especially as something as egregious as suggesting that they're an agent of a foreign power or a foreign combatant. That's what happened to me on a Clubhouse. Some you know, maniac got the idea that they wanted to open a room about me. They opened the room, invited people in, and held it for hours and suggested that I was a foreign combatant and that I was an agent of the Chinese government and that I'm not allowed back in the United States and that they're going to call the CIA and FBI on me. You're talking to a man that knows people who were killed by the FBI, uh, has loved ones in prison right now, in prison, has mentors who have been imprisoned by COINTELPRO. So first and foremost, for me, uh, there is no amount of price or money that I would sell my soul and my integrity on behalf of my people. And I don't even play those games, man. Like, like you know, you know, just, just calling people a snitch, this call, like when you call someone an agent or a government, you're basically putting the target on their back. You're basically, you know, in, in war, they're enemy of the state. And so you've issued them a death war, a death wish. So I take it very seriously. And so people need to have their facts together and have their receipts when they're doing this. But this is the climate that we're living in right now. And I think that a lot of Americans aren't concerned about it because it's not them. And unfortunately, a lot of Americans are not pro-China. And so if you hear someone even moderately pro-China, they're automatically thrown into this, this camp. And it's almost like the McCarthy era. And um, it's oh, a wild time. But... We, are, we are seeing a returning to kind of that Cold War rhetoric. You are either with us or against us. It's, everything is, is uh, you know, black and white. <laughs> and, 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 and right now we are... Uh, I mean, I'm I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I, I never, I never imagined we will be in the situation we are today. Say five, six, even five, six years ago. I, I, you know, people. Well, at the time, my one, well, my uh, friend who is, uh, uh, who who is a Korean American dude uh, trying to get a, a a job at defense contractor. He was a, a professor at UCLA, but he decided to join private industry for more more. Uh, for more money, but to 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 become a pri uh, defense contractor, they need to do your background checks and you know they need he need to get his clearance. And uh, he used to joke with me. He said, "Wait, is it because I know you who is from communist China? Would that mean I would not have trouble to get clearance?" Back then, we had a laugh because we thought it was just so we, we we you know we took it as a joke. We're laughing about it with us. But today, that's not a joke anymore. Today, I mean, there's there Chinese American who's been targeted, but precisely because of ethnicity. They they we just had a MIT professor, uh, uh, Gang Chen, who just got cleared of all charges. You know, after being arrested for, right. for you know, for for uh, allegedly on behalf of a uh, uh, you know Chinese government. But but you know, they put his him and his family through hell for for over a year. And and this is this is all this is like now every Chinese ethnic Chinese person in U.S. got a target painted on their back. I mean, I you you me even I I just all I do just shit post on social media on Twitter. But <laughs> after after people you know like there was a former New York Times journalist who said I am uh, he calls me like a, a characteristic of a. a, a what is it, a Chinese influence off, right? And and then I was getting anonymous DMs on Twitter. People show me the image of where I used to, where I live in uh, Fountain Valley, California, like a picture outside of my house and, and said, oh, you, do you know, recognize this? We know where you live, right? And th this was, oh, luckily, this happened two weeks before I was, about to leave U.S. I already have my plane ticket bought to go to China, <laughs> and and I already gave up my lease. <laughs> so I'm like, come get me, you know. <laughs> and, but, but but there's some crazy nutcases who do stuff like that. I mean, I, most of the time they're just co cowards. They're just online these these online trolls, you know. But but you have you're right. You have to take it seriously because there there are some crazy nut nutcases out there who who may be out there to out to harm you. You have to protect yourself. You're absolutely correct. I mean, I mean, I mean, just look at the rise in in attacks on Asians in America. 
And, and I know that this has always been, I mean, I acknowledge that this is a political football. I acknowledge that both Republicans and Democrats exploit the Asian American community for their own interests. But if you are not witnessing, if you're not paying attention to what's happening, uh, we cannot deny the reality that Asian Americans are being targeted more than ever. They're being victims of more crimes and attacks. And people like to dismiss it by saying, well, that's just good old American crime. They're near, you know, they're, they're, they're in crime ridden places. Um, these are attacks by mentally ill people. But I don't think people realize the connection that, you know, people with mental illness are still part of our society. They are still impacted by the propaganda in our society. And if you don't think that these people aren't seeing the news and hearing the news and hearing all of this rhetoric being pumped every day, all day, that is so anti-Chinese. And if you don't think that's having an effect on some of their behavior, when you clearly see it in the video examples where these people are you know, spouting out racist comments that the first Asian person they see spitting on them, attacking them, that hatred, that seed is being planted because we're allowing this anti-China Sinophobia, so much space, so much space in our popular culture, in, in, in the most extreme culture that we have from the alt right to the alt, le alt left. Everyone's getting in on it. I was thinking of a friend, I'm not going to say his name, but he, he is a journalist. He, he, he has a podcast that's extremely successful and they talk about China issues. And he's pretty moderate, in my opinion. Uh, I, I'd say he's more of a neoliberal. He's a staunch Democrat, pro-American. Uh, he's always pushing back against China. He's, he's trying to, you know, take a moderate path. He is by, by no means a pro-communist. Uh, he's never been. And yet uh, you find guys like Gordon Chang are attacking him on social media, saying this guy is, you know, a commie and an agent. It's like, if you're going to go after, you know, the moderates, th there's no one safe, you know, and it's this we've shifted in America quietly to the extreme. We have gone so far left and so far right that I don't even know where we are. We're off the charts. But when I see the guy, what's the comedian, um, Trevor Noah, uh, who, who does an episode on China that is completely CIA scripted. Like he he's talking about China and Africa, colon, you know, saying that the Chinese are colonizing Africa, which is completely not based in fact. And he's doing it in a way that does nothing but fear, I mean project fear and hatred against the Chinese government. You've got him doing that. I think just recently, um, the office or some TV show just read a little clip. Hey, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can't hear you, Carl. Yeah, 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 sorry. I muted. I muted. I was just making a snarky comment about the fact that uh, Noah, Trevor Noah is a well-known sympathizer of, uh, of African workers' plight when he made fun of the South African miners who, who got brutally gunned down by the police. You know, in his comedy skit, he wasn't, like, that was part of his comedy stand-up. And, and then he tried to ha sue everybody who tried to put that clip on YouTube on copyrights, on copyrights infringement. Yes. This is the guy now pretends that he is for our African worker rights and talk about China, China's neo-colonialism, neo-imperialism in Africa. I mean, this guy has no credibility. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just, it, it, and, and the segment wasn't even funny. The, 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 his China segment, I watched it. I'm like, you know, I know you're a comedy guy. <laughs> you are, I mean, okay. The, even, you know, I know a lot of artistic license is granted for big comedy. Uh, but right now you are serving not just bad propaganda, but it's actually bad comedy because it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now, he lost a lot of respect for me. And uh, it really it was concerning because of the reach that he has, the millions of people that saw that propaganda. And, and, and for me, it's just I applaud all the people that push back and provide good information. At the end of the day, you know, all, you know, all I can do. Because I don't expect people to believe me either. 
But, you know, I'm doing my job if I provide the information to the public and, and get it out there so that they can see for themselves. And, uh, you know, I, I've been fortunate to come across these incredible scholars and academics that time and time again have pushed back and debunked the whole debt diplomacy and, you know, this, this imperialism in China by imperialism in Africa by the Chinese and anyone uh, remotely familiar with with Chinese history and who can compare the history of European colonialism with the experience of China and Africa can see that there is absolutely no comparison. None. The audacity to even suggest that Chinese have inflicted slavery and killed and slaughtered and, and genocide and, and set up apartheid states and, and instigated so many wars in Africa, uh, to, to compare that to European colonialism is, is just atrocious and coming from an African himself. And so it was really disappointing, but that's where we are with the propaganda, man. And even, you know, and I, I'm calling out the black people. I'm calling out Trevor Noah. I'm calling out Herschel Walker. I'm ca calling out Candace Owen. I'm calling out the people from my uh, community. I'm even seeing African-American, uh, if you will, academics who claim to be specialists on the black experience in China. I just saw this one sister, I'm not even gonna say her name, but, and she's affiliated with some, you know, US, ex US ambassadors. And I believe she might be with the Asian society, but these groups that are completely biased in their agenda, she's trying to portray the black experience in China in the most negative light possible. And we're not getting the truth and the balance. And um, I talked a little bit about it before on your show. Recently, I talked on Danny Haifang's show, uh, and I'm always looking to talk more about the realities of the Black experience in China. And, and we, we need to do an entire another episode just on Black experience in China. I want to hear it from you, first-hand experience, because like today, because China and also Africa has gained a lot more prominence in the in the media cycle right now we're, we're we're getting flooded by these propaganda so it's good to hear kind of the truth from the, the, the what you observe on the ground versus what we're being fed force fed through cnn uh, bbc and and wall street journals right and and so yeah so i definitely want you back for an episode just for that you know, like, like, because, because this, this episode we decided to devote to kind of Malcolm X and the Africa connection because there's just so much to talk about and, and there's so much material, but yet very few people know about it. So I, I thought, you know, we really got to bring this to light. The, the, the fact that uh, Malcolm X, who is a very inspirational figures for many, you know, he found his own inspiration in China, but that fact is very, very less no i mean like i i remember he talked about uh, uh the chinese ambassador huang hua he met in ghana in, in 1964 and he had very good things to say about about uh, about huang hua and and the fact that is a uh, uh, i'm just gonna i'm just gonna quote here I, I'm, I'm reading the passage from uh uh, this is answers and interviews, and there's an actual chapter called The Red Chinese Ambassador. And, and Malcolm X said, uh, when I was in Ghana, I had an opportunity in May, and then again when I was in Africa a couple of weeks ago, to have dinner with a Chinese ambassador there. When I say the Chinese ambassador, I don't mean Chiang Kai-shek's ambassador. I had a dinner with the Chinese ambassador that represents some 700 million people, and I found the man to be very intelligent, very well informed. He acted more human than many of the Americans that I have met. And he was well informed on the problems here. He didn't sound racist. He didn't sound fan fanatic. He did not sound unreal. He seemed to be a very objective. Uh, he seemed to have a very objective picture in front of him. He didn't sound like he was anti-American. He didn't sound like he was anti-white. In fact, he told me that it was silly for a person to be, uh, to be, to be um, placed or allow himself to be placed in the position of a racist. racist. And, and this is a very famous passage. You know, a lot, a lot of people who read Malcolm X have read this passage, but very few people even know the name 
of this Chinese ambassador Malcolm X has spoken to because he is this Chinese ambassador. His name is Huang Hua, and he's actually a very famous Chinese diplomat inside China. Uh, he is a guy that in 1936, while still a student at, at Yanqing University in Beijing, he accompanied the American leftist writer and journalist Ed, Edgar Snow to the Northwest Communist base in Yan'an to meet Mao, and that's where where and to become Edgar Snow's uh, uh, English Chinese translator. And and Edgar Snow wrote. The Red Star over China, which became a very influential work among the Chi uh, American leftists, you know, to, to shaping the opinions about China. This was like in 19 1936, around the time when China was at war with Japan. You know, World War II haven't officially started. U.S. Had wasn't officially part part of the war, but the, you know, Ch China was already in the midst of fighting. Huang Hua was there. He accompanied Edward Snow. When he went travel to the communist base, he decided he wasn't going to leave. He wasn't going to return back to his student life in Beijing. He wanted to join Mao's movement, and he did because his fluency in English, you know, Mao made him, um, you know, part of the communist uh, liaison. Um, uh, branch the, to, for the outreach program, and, and eventually, after founding of the People's Republic of China, he became a top Chinese diplomat, uh, working directly under Zhou Enlai, and he was uh, posted as ambassador from 1960s to 1970s, and that is when uh, Malcolm Max met him, and and uh, this is so so like I you know I'm like you bring a very good point is like. People know about Malcolm X. People read Malcolm X writing, but some, for some odd reason, that China connection just escaped people's radar. I, I'm so happy you brought up that quote because uh, that's one of the reasons I came to China. That quote of that experience that he had uh, with the Chinese ambassador, the diplomat, as well as a quote where Malcolm X says that Arabic is the most powerful spiritual language and Chinese is the most powerful political language in the world. And, you know, there's a lot of attention that we give to Malcolm's letter when he, from Mecca and talking about this conversion experience that he had and opening his eyes and being more human and, and being more of a humanist and being the importance of not being racist. There's so much emphasis on that. I myself is, I'm also a Muslim. You know, I went to Hajj myself inspired by Malcolm X. So I don't understate the importance of that. But I would argue that this letter, I believe it was a letter or statement that he talked about the Chinese ambassador is just as important as his letter from Mecca. Because what he was doing was having a transformation and sharing it with the world saying that, hey, these communist guys, they're not racist. They're not extremists. They're human beings. They're human beings. They're part of the human family. We shouldn't put them outside of the human family. They're very reasonable and balanced and intelligent. That impact to say that he was one of the most humane people that he ever met, that verifies and aligns with my experience, 22, 22 years in China, traveling all over the country, meeting with the people, struggling with the people. These are the people that I know. These are the people that I've met. They're not racist. They're not fanatics. They're... they're, they're they're human beings, very intelligent human beings and decent human beings. And this idea that somehow the Communist Party of China is disconnected from its people, that it's not made up of its own people, that, you know, like, like they always try to separate the party from the people. It's like, listen, there are 90 million members of the Communist Party. They, they're very complex. You know, they, they give you the whole gamut of, of the human experience. Stop trying to portray these people as this evil cult and that's a monolith that needs to be destroyed and wiped off the planet. Because all you're doing is feeding into the same type of rhetoric that ends up getting people killed and murdered. We never talk about how many communists that have been killed by the U.S. government. We don't even think about that. We always talk about how many people that the communists have killed. But when is the last time we've taken a tally of how many victims of America's wars, whether it's in Vietnam or Korea or anywhere, Indonesia, you name it, 
uh, that we've allowed to be killed because they were communist. And so I think like that quote is so important because he's humanizing these people that he's, he's meeting. He's making a, a genuine connection that hopefully for people that aren't familiar with Malcolm X, that got to see this, this talk, this conversation between me and you, we can see this connection between Malcolm and Chinese people throughout his life uh, that's continuing to this day. I am following in the footsteps of Malcolm X in his legacy. I came to China and immediately after arriving in China, following the footsteps of Vic Vicky Garvin, and following the footsteps of Malcolm X, I taught Malcolm X at Shanghai High School, the autobiography of Malcolm X at school the first year in 1999 that I arrived. I was given that space to do that. And also thanks to you, I want to salute to you and your wonderful fans and patrons for the support and love that they've given me as well because I got that opportunity to speak once again uh, at, at, a, at a school in Shanghai, in Kudong, uh, because of the, the pandemic and um, COVID restrictions. I did it via video, but I'm talking to high school kids about Malcolm X in China and that we can have these conversations and that the Chinese people are not racist. They don't hate black people. The Communist Party certainly isn't. And uh, we need to move beyond all this BS. Thank you, man. Thank. Well said. Well said. I mean, like that. This is this is a conversation that's so much needed right now at this moment. And 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 all the you know what what like like you said what Malcolm X writing humanized this the sinister enemy that the CIA is trying to paint. And and this is a key of the Cold War propaganda is to dehumanize your opponents to make them your enemies. They're they're they they became. They became no longer human, so it's okay to to hate them, to kill them, and that you know that is we're seeing that pre, the repercussion of that in U.S. today. You know, as you mentioned earlier, the anti-Asian violence that is just a part of it, and and you know we we so much need to have this conversation right now to to push back to push back against the, the warmongers and their propaganda, and to give people the 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 real truth and. And as I mentioned before, I definitely need to have you back to do a devote an entire episode on the real black experience in China because we we so much need that right now. Well, it'll be my honor. I look forward to coming back. I'm gonna see you soon. I appreciate you, and I just want to encourage you to yeah, keep keep up the good work, keep fighting, keep spreading the message, stay relentless, and yeah, I'm definitely here for you. All right, all right. Um, we, we did. It. We we have been doing an uh, hour and seventeen minutes. Is there any other you know lasting word, last words, any part parting words you want to share with my audience? I just want to spread goodwill, peace, love, and unity. You know, these, these are like quite provocative issues. Their life and death matters. I take it very seriously. Um, I come from a militant background, but uh, I believe there's a time for peace and a time for war, and um. I think peace is, is the ultimate goal, and I definitely want to be an advocate of peace and love. That's why I commit myself to hip-hop and using that as a tool to bring people together. And so despite how, how crazy it is out here, the tensions, I still want to leave on that message of peace and love and unity. I've got nothing but love in my heart, um, and I welcome people to China. Uh, if you can get over here, get over here. You can look me up, find me, and uh, you know, join with us in this glorious hip hop revolution that we're partaking in over here. And, um, you know, just spread love. Look forward to having, you know, good food and good times and, and enjoying life with people uh, as we do fight back against injustice. Keep it yes. in balance, man. Yes, and, and, and thank you once again, Dana, for coming to the show to speak to me and to, to my audience about, about these issues. And, and also thank you for doing a heck of a job popularizing, helping pop popularizing hip hop in China. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm your fan now. So uh, we, let's do this again. Let's do this again in the future. Okay. Take care, brother. Yeah, th 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 thank you, thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have one, uh, have another episode before Chinese New Year or, or after Chinese New Year. <laughs> and because uh, because I can't wait. I can't wait to till we do the episode on the black experience on China. Okay, my audience.
<laughs> I, my my audience, uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, uh, next time, I'm gonna bring Dana back, so we're gonna get some real truth on on, on living in China as a black person. <laughs> and 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 uh, uh, th and uh, thanks and goodbye. I'm gonna stop recording.